In this video, we're going to talk about Rivian. So many people are kind of disappointed by the stock and myself included. But of course, I didn't really buy when it first went public and opposite to many YouTubers and articles online, I wasn't that optimistic about it from the get go. So my perspective might have been a little bit different from what the mainstream uh, position was. But look, it was once one of the biggest IPOs to ever go public. I think it was something like above $100 billion uh, when it first began trading. But the situation went downwards very quickly. And if I may add, logically so. So the current situation, of course, is a far cry from those heydays. Um, but it went public when the timing was bad, was very bad actually, because investors and stakeholders from the EV sector wanted out. They wanted to move out their cash by the time when Rivian went public. And then even bigger waves of sell-off market-wide occurred. And this has caused even further capital flight. People might have been willing to put their money into savings account, into fixed income um, assets, or into like traditional blue chips companies, instead of companies like Rivian, or other EV or growth stocks, because they might be considered as too risky. So is it just the cause of Rivian? Well, we're going to come back to this in a short while. So it has reasons coming from the economy as a whole, uh, reasons beyond the economy, reasons coming from the supply chain difficulties, and also from its own fundamentals, or from its own business model, shall I say. The geopolitical instabilities, you know, needless to add, uh, has been a major factor in the markets tumbling. The supply chains like always, there has been a shortage of uh, semiconductors, so this is certainly not helping. And of course, the possible disruptions of logistics around the world, um, that's also not helping either, especially with the delivery of key components, either batteries or rare earth. So this is, these are like the macro reasons, if you will. And the other thing is, the current performance of Rivian, it has been it has been mitigated. So a lot of the things that caused this downfall are outside of its control. I mean, they cannot end wars, right? They cannot just magically make appear uh, 15 million semiconductors out of thin air. And they can also not just make appear a bunch of rare earth in their backyard. So for those issues, I would say that it's sector wide and it's not necessarily its fault, although it's definitely not helping. But if we look at its business model, Rivian makes pickup trucks. There are two other companies that make uh, similar products, even though they're at different stage and with different reputations, if I may add. They are Hydeon and Nikola. Nikola has been embroiled into like scandals and so on, and it still is with its with the issues surrounding Trevor Milton, the former CEO, as well as his replacement. So I can't even remember the name of the gentleman because I stopped following Nikola's news afterwards, but I know that recently he decided to retire which is never a good news for this kind of companies. And your captain just decides to take off, right? And leaves the ship in the middle of a huge storm. So this is never good. Hydeon has never had any sort of, you know, scandals. But I think that it's just a question of investors not really believing that this business model could work in the medium to long term. And then a lot of them pulled out their chips. I think that this also kind of explains why Rivian has been having some difficulties attracting new capital coming in. So 
despite all these difficulties, it's still scaling up its production as planned. This is the one thing that we can give to, um, to Rivian's management. They're still advancing despite a lot of the difficulties and the mounting pressure, in my opinion, from the shareholders um, to ask the company to perform better, at least financially speaking. But if we look at the price action, I would say that recently the price action has kind of bottomed out. And because of this, I think that if you want to see any sort of hope, this might be the beginning of a slow recovery. This slow recovery is the, re the intention of the company. Of course, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be immune from other sector-wide phenomenons or that it's going to be immune from the economy's state because right now we're likely going to go into a recession on a global scale and this never bodes well with industries that require a favorable economic and financial environment to operate. But nevertheless, the higher oil and gas price may have triggered uh, the need to switch or to at least diversify the pickup truck fleet um, from like purely combustion engines, the hybrids, and also EV pure plays. Like it's possible that this has triggered, at least in the heart of some business people and of some trucking businesses, uh, the need to change its logistics, the need to change its gears. This might be like something that is still in the form of a seed, like the seed has been planted, but we don't know if it's necessarily going to pan out over the next few years. It might go beyond just, you know, two, three years. It could take five, it could take 10. But right now, at least the intention of Rivian is to go back up. And the market has lost a significant portion. Of course, it has lost a significant portion of its, of its market cap, but also of the short sellers, or if you will, of the people who have been dumping positions. Their positions have been dumped. So by definition, mechanically, it could edge upward. It's going to be a slow grind for sure, but this is a beginning. The EV market, we have to remember, has lost much of its aura um, from back to 2020. And we might need to give it some time before the industry adapts to new realities. Rivian needs to prove that the pickup truck industry is ready for like the electrification movement. And once it does, the market will react much more favorably. At the moment, they still need some more convincing. So we still have some road to go ahead. But the good news is, at least the price is not that high for an entry ticket. And if you believe in the long-term like potentials of electrified peak pickup trucks, or the if you believe that the sector as a whole might switch from combustion engines to alternatives, whatever the alternatives is, you might want to take a look at Rivian and especially now. So I would recommend to buy uh, Rivian if you believe, if you qualify for the two factors above. And I would recommend you to be patient. This investment is likely to be rewarded as long as you keep your position at a tolerable level. So even if it tanks significantly from here, I doubt that it's, I really doubt it that it's going to tank significantly. But let's just say that even if it does, you will not budge. It, it'll not hurt you as much as if you put in a significant chunk of the exposure in, right? So I would recommend to put in um, one to 3% of your portfolio for now. And if we see more favorable signals coming from the industries, then maybe crank it up to, you know, three to 5%. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. 
The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option, and assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up, or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another, and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When companies announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.